question for you, but I think it's more, more or less for Steven, not for you. Steven, when do you think, at, at what growth point do you think it's, it's time to go on to, so you've got the corporates, you've got the churches, you've got the schools, and you've got the backyards. At what point do people jump over to your world, the rides, the mechanical rides? Well, if you're already doing corporate in schools, that's when you start getting into it. Um, however, what, what, what dollar amount? Because I, I look here already, and I can tell the big boys, and I can tell that some of them do factors for forever. That's all they do. That's their bread and butter, and they make a shitload of money on in it. So, is there a, a, a <laughs> dollar amount or a time? You've been in it five, ten years, and well, it's time to. What do you think? What's your opinion? My my observance is people start getting into smaller mechanical rides, things that don't take a lot of. Uh, mechanical knowledge and i would say they start doing it around 250,000 maybe 150 to 250,000 in other words people that own 15 bounces or something to that effect or inflatables might start getting into simple things like a trackless train which i don't make but that's a product that would be a, a good beginner product because it's like a lawnmower it's a little easier for people to learn on the handle or a smaller ride but most smaller rides don't bring in the big bucks. You know, if you get a carousel, you're looking at eight and under, nine and under using it, which means if you play a festival or a pay for play where you're charged to go on the ride, you're only going to get little kids. If you go to a school, high school's not going to rent that. So if you're going to get into rides, your, your best bet to start making money immediately would be to go into what middle rides like a Tubbs of Fun, a trackless train, those type of rides, maybe 240, 250,000 is the range. But probably when you own 15 to 20 inflatables, you'd start off with something simple like a train, in my opinion. I'm not going to mention names, but somebody told me a long time ago, so I, think, I think it's a sack words where I didn't get my first bull to my first million. So, th so then, I listen to that, someone, you know, someone just as old as you, who I respect, then what do you say to that? Because you just said, at 250, you start looking at other stuff. And the other guy, who's somewhere in here, he said, I didn't get my first bull to my first million. That totally contradicts what you said. Well, keep in mind, different markets and different people's business thoughts are going to change the answer. Um, I started when I was, what, 18 years old in the ride business, even younger. But I got into mechanical rides maybe 2021 is when I started purchasing my first mechanical rides. However, they were after I started renting them from other people enough and people were asking me for them. Then I realized instead of renting them from my competitor and losing the inflatables and the rest of the job, it was time to get into that market. So, Would you say it was your sales, you as a salesman? Or your market, because I, I agree with what you're saying. My market is different from everybody else's market. So, were you an incredible salesman that knew you could sell it to everyone you talked to, or were you just in a sweet spot? I'm in a sweet spot for corporate. I get a lot of that. I don't have to fight for it. It got, it's actually stunted my growth because I got lazy with marketing because I it's just I'm in San Francisco. That's all I get corporate. So, were you an incredible salesman or you an incredible market to get to that point of getting the rights? Both. Um... When it, when it comes, first of all, I was on the phone, you know, right now people use the computer, so you don't have a lot of contact with your customers. But back in the day, we were on the phone with every customer, and they pretty much told us their Santa's list, what they wanted. So we knew if we were getting calls for whatever, a carousel, five or 10 calls a month, we knew it was time to look into that option. And it didn't matter how much my sales were at that point, what mattered was what the customers were looking for. So is your market. Okay, cool. The, the market is important, but you can also create your own market. One of my favorite sayings was there's a, a guy who owns a shoe company and he has two salesmen and he sends them to Africa. And he says to the first salesman, he goes, here's a thousand shoes, go to Africa, sell them. Then he says to the second salesman, here's a thousand shoes, go to Africa, sell them. A month later, he calls the first salesman and the guy says, I want to come home. The guy says, why? He goes, because they don't sell shoes in Africa. So he calls the second salesman and goes, how's it going? He goes, send me another thousand shoes. And the guy says, why? He goes, because they don't sell shoes in Africa. 
So one guy saw it as an open market and the other guy saw it as they don't sell it, why bother? So it depends on your way of doing business and how you think. However, there's nothing wrong with opening up a new market. You know, who knows what's going to happen, but you're going you're gonna to need schools to really make money and corporate to make money with rides. Backyard parties, you'll make money too, but that's not going to be your big bucks. You know, the hope with the mechanical ride, then I'll shut up for a minute, but the hope with the mechanical ride is that you're going to tow it there and you're going to bring two or three inflatables also to the event and other things. You know, that's the hope. You don't want to just bring a, not that you don't want to bring a mechanical ride alone, but you want to capture the whole event or create bigger events for people. But the, the thing is, what I think uh, as a problem is um, to run big rides or rides and to do backyard parties, take two different uh, employees. And I think that is where people fail is they used to do backyard parties and now they want to do bigger events. Uh, I mean, I, a, a simple thing that I see people do is I want to expand, I want to do, and then they buy a photo booth. Now they are doing inflatables and they need to do a photo booth. And I, I know uh, uh, what uh, um, Ismail does, he decided he's gonna set it up and leave. But how we do our photo booths is we leave somebody with it because that's what we do. So, and in general, that's what people do with photo booths. So, and that's just an example. So now you do your inflatables and for a six, seven, eight hundred dollar photo booth, you need to have somebody there setting it up and it needs to be somebody that know what they're doing. And if you're small, you are there setting up a photo booth instead of going in, uh, um, uh, um, uh, do inflatables that you can do two, one, two inflatables and they make more money. Yes, that's true. Um, and again, what the other problem is you buy a mechanical ride and you're not mechanically inclined you know, it's a, it's a trailer with a machine, you know, with a, an engine on it, you know, so you have to be ready for, I don't want to say a new set of problems, but you have to understand things are going to happen that are going to be different than when you just blow up a bounce. So you're going to need a mechanic or somebody who understands why a ride spins in a circle, you know, things like that. You don't want to just send anybody out with it if you get to that point. Yeah. Uh, Ty, do you have any mechanical rides? Like Euro bungees, Euro bungees, rock walls, that type of stuff. Nothing more mechanical. We were going to do, we had a deposit on a swing for this year and then COVID hit. So I pulled that real quick mm -hmm. and that's it. No, I, back to the two different staff. Like we got our asses handed to it this year because we're not backyard guys. My staff don't know how to do backyards. They're so inefficient at it. They, we don't know how to book them. Like it was like, my guys are corporate, you know? Four or five guys go to an event. That's it. We, we can't do more than one drop in a day. So what, what did you do? Uh, how did you um, get them to um, go backyards? Or do you do any backyards at all? No, we did like, I think, like we did five and it was all terrible. Like, <laughs> I honestly, I just, yeah, I just told, I just told, Emma in the office I said, don't book them. I just tell them we're not available. I didn't want to do them because they were way too much work. And, yeah. yeah. That. I think that is um, our bigger guys. That's the problem. You, your guys are set up to do bigger events, go to the big events and do the big events. And then, then they have to go to a backyard where so they need to boom, 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 set it up. They, 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 don't, they don't do it. Yeah, that's that's not our that's not what I've trained my guys to do. It's not any of that. Like it just it's a total different game, and that's really kicked our butt this year because of that. You know, it, it it's interesting because I would have thought it'd be the opposite way that people would rather do backyards because it's simpler. You know, corporate takes a lot more time. You got to be there an hour too early. You can't just show up thirty minutes early. You know, there's a lot more planning in corporate. I'm surprised. Um, and a lot of things that saved some of these companies this year were the backyard parties. 
that seemed to be a lifesaver. I know that my bigger corporation, you know, my bigger event company friends, they took it harder than the guys who went out and did backyard parties for sure. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Like not being a backyard company definitely hurt a lot more this year because there was zero corporate. Like I think we did one festival this year and that was it. And so what, what did you do with your people? Because they're not doing anything. Do they do something else? Well, no, yeah. Because we got we had like a separate division. We had a tent division. Mm -hmm. So our tents rocked it this year because all the venues were closed down for weddings. Because our rules were you were allowed 50 people indoors or 100 people outdoors and a tent classified as outdoors. And I got that class classification from the government. I got the, all the documents. So everyone that booked their venues had to cancel and go to tent weddings. So we were doing a ton of tents and then I bought a porta potty company about three weeks after COVID hit to try and make up guys. So we had guys running septic trucks every day. Yeah, that's a shitty job. I was in it all day today. I was stuck in poop. <laughs> um, how, how does that work? Is it, um, is it something to look into to do or is it something uh, you would... With COVID? Yeah, we can't keep up. Like I've got washroom trailers. I think we got six washroom trailers right now that are out. 2500 bucks a month. And I've got them booked out for the next 10 months. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard about the people that do the, uh, the dumpsters. How do you think it compares to that? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I've looked at dumpsters. I think porta potties, like, I mean, porta potties, I make 150 bucks just to show up there. It takes me five minutes. I don't have to go to the garbage disposal, dump it, and then take it somewhere else. I'm able to do like a route with my trucks. Mm -hmm. So that's right. what I like to put it. That's buy also a, still in the To buy all this stuff new or is it an existing business? No, it was actually an existing business. Yeah, they they talked to me like a year and a half ago about selling. And then like as literally COVID hit, I sat down with my team, like what are we going to do? And then we called them up and just got a deal with them. So we bought, <laughs> what did it come with? Three trailers? Yeah, I think it came with three trailers, three trucks, and about 30 porta potties. And then we added another 30 porta potties, another three trail, four trailers. Four so you didn't, trailers. you didn't know anything about it. You just kind of learned on the fly. Nothing. I learned. Oh. I knew nothing. The how about these portable? How about these portable washing stations? Were those, were, were they, those with this company too, or are those new? They had, they had two. And then you bought more. Yeah, we're at, we're at 40 now. I think. Same, same kind of thing Stephen was talking about earlier. You're like, well, shit, I just got all this demand. So I'm like, well, I want to keep buying them. Yeah, like, I mean, we were we were going, like, we we got sinks. Like, sink, sinks was a big one. This company had two sinks. And I sold a lot of sinks in March. Like, my first two were gone. That was the end of who are it. They, who are they going to? Um, I did everything from, I had stuff at grocery stores, at the front of grocery stores, um, office buildings, restaurants. Um, oil field I had stuff at. I had machine shops. Um, a lot of this is COVID related, you think? Everything's COVID related. Yeah, yeah. Everything was COVID related. Um, we were we were building sinks. In I remember March, we went to Home Depot and I was buying vanities, putting backboards on them, taping off the making taking the handles off the sinks and just having a spout come out. And putting building a pump system with two buckets underneath, because I was so I was building those for three hundred fifty dollars, and I was renting those out for one hundred and fifty dollars a week, one month minimum I think it was. And I was getting those out four or five months. I had one out for like seven months I think it was. Like I just got it back. So the demand is crazy there. Like we've got what city, what city are you in? Where I'm in Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. Oh, okay. So we've got two COVID, two COVID testing sites right now that we've got washroom trailers at. One testing site just ordered another trailer and another handicap unit. And I just got someone to come in. They want four trailers for four months. They just want to quote on. Wow.
I mean, septic saved our butt. Like we'll do, you know, at least just about half a million dollars in septic this year. Tyre, you're running that company, you know, totally separate or is part of your rental business? It's, it's together. We run it together just because it, there's yeah, there's, there's two in the office and then me. So we weren't sure we put it all together because then, you know, Emma in the office can still, she answers the phone, she schedules the guys, she routes it. So Actually, you, you love it because you are inside of one of them right now. So Honestly, I, <laughs> my favorite thing no to better. do. My favorite thing to do is to go run a, run a septic truck because I can just like put my headphones in. I go out, do it, come back at the end of the day. It's not it too easy. So, no, it, uh, it, to be honest, it saved our butt. Uh, just so you know, the larger corporations use them all the time for events. You know, when you get into Pfizer and you get into Bristol Myers and all those kind of events, they put them all over the place. You know, they, they, they have a market in our industry. They're still part of the event industry. That's, Even at IAPI, you see them outside. That's kind of why we did it too, is because we know when everything comes back, what we've built, like with our tent company, everything like that, we'll be able to easily sell them to all of our clients there. Like all of our weddings, all of our weddings, we'll take our washroom trailers, all the wedding, a bunch of weddings we did this year took porta potties. We were able to throw it on the back of the truck, you know, make an extra couple hundred bucks. Um, you mind telling me how much did the previous company do in a year? It was probably closer to two fifty, three hundred thousand. Yeah, I think it was. Okay, it was three hundred thousand dollars they did last year, but a hundred thousand of that was one job that's no longer here. So two hundred realistically of like constant work is what they had. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Is this? Uh, Flap up some Google AdWords. You do any outbound calling? Um, how are these things getting out? Honestly, we answer our phone. Well, you did. I mean, people didn't know you had hitters until you know you didn't have those until March or April. So we did one Facebook post. Yeah, I think we I think we post on Facebook once. <laughs> I've done zero advertising for it. Oh wow. Um, oh no, we we did some SEO ranking. Yeah, okay. website. I guess I did. I did. You're right, I get SEO ranking. That was pretty much it. So we ranked number one area. Like this company has been around for two years. Um, but the two guys that had it before, they, they had two full-time jobs. So they would get a call and they wouldn't, they were like, oh no, we, we don't do that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh yes, we'll do that. Like, you put a little, yeah, you put a little time and effort into it. Yeah. What's, the, know, what's, the, web, what's the website? VIPportable.ca. So, oh, website's so bad. Yeah. That one? Does CA stand for California? Yeah, that's what it is. That's the EPA. <laughs> so, no, it's uh, been pretty good. The washroom trailers are my bread and butter. You can, uh, you can pick up washroom trailers. I'm picking them up anywhere from $10,000 to $15,000 used. Like, there's a ton in the States, like Georgia, North Carolina. There's a bunch in Texas I saw. They always go up at auction because companies go bankrupt with them. Um, and that's where I'm picking them up. Here we go. Why do you think they're going bankrupt? Why? Because yeah. I think, like that trailer right there, that's forty five thousand dollars to buy new. That's that's a lot to spend. Your trucks are hundred grand. You know, we've got a lot invested into it. So do you think, think they went into it and financed everything, and COVID caused them? No, or or you know, it's also or it's oil field companies. Okay. It's it's a lot of I bought a lot from oil field companies that ran the oil when the oil was big, they ran that, and then when oil's not big, well, you don't have it. So like I mean, we've got some stuff on oil. Yeah, I've got like one trailer on oil right now. So, I. Wow. We've decided not to hedge our bets on oil. When it comes big, we're not going to go buy a bunch of stuff just to protect ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, Jeff, uh, did you look into doing the uh, the dumpsters or not? I, I didn't. 
I mean, we were uh, we were at the start of the year transitioning and you know trying to do a lot more corporate, you know. But I luckily we are focused on backyard parties. So all the, albeit we were down this year, probably thirty percent. You know, we still had a pretty decent year. Um, all being told. So no, I, I never, I just wasn't, uh, I'd probably scared. I didn't want to, I mean, I, I saw that as being a, a sizable investment to start that, the dump. Stuff. And I, I researched it around here too. And it seemed like, you know, just a simple Google search. I mean, there's friggin' 10, 15 companies in Raleigh that already do it. And I see him driving around. I mean, I pay attention. So I, I just didn't, not, and not to mention the fact that they go for, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks. It didn't seem like it was uh, over the top, you know. So on that, like, Willem, did you guys do it? No. No, no I, looked in, I looked into it and then I decided not to do it. Because, like, say, like, a 20-yard dumpster is worth four grand to buy. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Yep. So it rents for, what, 350 a month? Yeah, I think it's a little bit more than that for a month. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't have we, have. we have two guys here that have companies. You know, uh, Cody have a company and Andre have a company of don't. So why don't you guys um, jump in and tell us? Yeah. Corey. I think Corey can't talk right now. I think he's literally laying in bed with his kid. Yeah, he's got twelve kids. He's he's got twelve kids. He can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is only small. <laughs> <laughs> you better get out of bed. Hey, it's only six, and we finally got a TV, okay? <laughs> get rid of the remote. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, no, so yeah, we did actually get into the dumpster business, and so for us, we got into smaller dumpsters. Um, what we're really looking for is kind of a homeowner or contractors that do smaller construction or renovation um, we got a lot of smaller islands and keys around us so you know you're not getting a big you know 20 30 yard dumpster um, you know anyone that that's asked me about it I always tell them it's definitely not inflatable money but it's not inflatable work either um, you know that the truck really does all the work you just back right up to it hook it on and tow it away and I mean that's it it doesn't matter if it's raining or of course you're going to have your different issues, but you know, the, the dumpster doesn't care if it's raining because it just doesn't get heavier. But um, for us, we're about 300 bucks and we do a four day rental. And so with that includes one ton of material and around me, it's about 63 to about $45 a ton to dispose of depending on what you're disposing of. So, you, you know, you drop it down to 200 bucks after that. Of course, anything over the one ton, you make the customer pay. Um, you know, we're, we're nowhere near big or dominating the market, but um, it's, it's a nice little extra income during the week. Um, you know, with COVID, we really didn't do any weekday stuff. So it for sure did help supplement that. How about, how about the initial investment? Uh, the initial you? investment uh, was, was pretty rough. Um, we actually went kind of the cheapest route just to get into it. But uh, so we got a truck or excuse me, a trailer and four bins and we're at, we were at about 27, five out the door. Okay. Uh, brand new, brand new stuff. Oh, uh, correct. That was all brand new. Okay. And so you already I, had, you already had trucks to pull them with, I guess. So that's correct. Um, yeah. yeah. So that, that kind of why we, why we went that route as well. But, you know, and I mean, it's a big piece of metal. It's going to, as long as you take care of it, it's going to last you, I don't want to say forever, but a lot longer than a bounce house definitely will. Yeah, so you're, you're flipping those, what, five times a month, four times a month? Uh, it's, so we average, a, our rental is up to four days, really. So we could, you know, turn them around realistically twice a month, or excuse me, twice a week if we needed to. But how do you handle asbestos or anything like that? No, we don't. What we if don't. a customer, you know, tries to dupe you with some stuff they're not allowed to? How do you how do you deal um, with that? So, so the reality behind it is, we we go to a transfer station and we kind of, you know, the 
the better you treat someone, the better they're going to treat you, I really believe. So we kind of became friends with them. And of, of course, if, if, you know, you drum one or two things, they'll pull it aside. Um, you know, anything more than that, they're really going to get you for it. But I, I think just communication is the key. But uh, it, in our contract, we do state, you know, anything that is hazardous actually still remains the property of whoever was putting it in the dumpster. So realistically, if we put up to a dumpster, they seen it, they could actually not let us dump there. And we could actually then turn around and take it back to the client. Now, what do you do when you take it back? Do they you just put it back to them or what? Uh, we, we've, we've never actually had to, so. Okay. I've, I've seen pictures of guys dump on their driveway and stuff like that. Yeah, it, and they just dump them right then and there. But so for us, and again, you know, I, I think with just like inflatables, you, you kind of screen your client and ask them what they're dumping in there. And, you know, you, you kind of know the age of the house and if you look up their address and whatnot. So. Yeah. Um, the other guy who does it, is it Andre Martins? Are you yeah, I'm here. How are you doing, guys? For some reason, my camera is not working. It's telling me to go to settings. I'm on my phone. Um, I agree with Corey what he says about um, it's not inflatables money, but it's not inflatables work either. It's a lot easier than inflatables. Uh, what I did was something similar, but I bought a use system. I bought a trailer with seven cans. I pay, I think I got a good deal. I paid 25000 for it for the whole setup. Um, my dumping fees here are a lot higher than uh, some people I'm in New York, so I pay 105 per ton. I get, um, I have uh, 12 yarders, 15s, and 20s. I get um, 350 for the 12, 365 for the 15s, and 385 for the 20s for a seven day rental. And they all include one ton material. Uh, where you make the money is on the overcharge uh, when they go over most people go over the tonnage and that's where you make the money I'm uh, not selling it either I'm just I started maybe three four months ago that I was fully functional because I think I'd, I'm 99.9% .9 backyard parties so I got very busy with the backyard parties but I not really put too much time into the dumpsters um but I'm averaging now, I'm averaging around three or four a week. This week is the first week that I have uh, six out. From, so I only have one left in the yard. So I think it's getting a little, uh, a little better. I'm having uh, SEO don't work. And that's the only uh, corn advertising I'm doing. Oh, I'm sorry, that. And uh, I'm also doing uh, not Angie's List, but the other one, uh, Home Advisor. That helps a lot, too. Mm. That's pretty much true. Uh, yeah, anybody else? Here? What, what do you? Uh, what's something else that you do outside of uh, inflatable? Ismail strips. What is that? Ismail strips. I think right, Ismail. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you. On the East Coast, a lot of the guys that have the trucks from the event business, like uh, Fantasy World, and other companies that are on the larger side, they use their trucks in the winter time for snow plowing. They try to get contracts so their guys can work all year round with the same trucks. We never did it. I always wanted to, but I just never bothered. Yeah. Now, now Stephen, I have a question for you. Um, I, I don't know everybody that's here on, on the call tonight, but um, I know you here in 2008 when we had the recession at that time, how compare that recession that we had in 2008 with the recession that we are you know, in the field, um, um, this time? Your connection's breaking up a little bit. Okay, um, I think it's um, somebody else's noise. Can you hear me now? I hear you. <clears throat> um, okay, so my question is um, 2008, we went into a recession and you have run your company at that time. Now in 2020, we have a recession. Where is the big difference between the recession in 2008 and the recession in 2020? What is the difference between the two? Well, uh, that's a good question. Remembering back to 2008, 
um, the townships were spending less. Uh, you know, we, were, we did a lot of towns in our area. We built them up over the years. They started cutting. I mean, I, I don't know if I could really do a comparison to now, uh, but because we know this, this was the year you could do backyards, but you couldn't get away with anything else because there was nothing else out there to have. So it's a little bit different. But back then when we started, it started hurting us. It was mostly uh, losing the townships and the corporations were backing out. They were still doing events, you know, they, they, because they had budgets for them and, you know, big companies have big tax breaks when they spend that money. So they had to spend it either way. So it, there was a, a downfall in the money. The other problem in 2008, more important than the recession was a lot of people that were laid off of their jobs, et cetera, started getting into the bouncy business. So it became a much bigger industry, which meant if I did on a Saturday 30 bounces, I was now doing 10 or 12, which meant I had to focus on the larger events to keep the money flowing. Well, I, I, I think um, what I see with the EPA and, and uh, with the responses of people in the groups is that there's a lot of people coming into the industry right now too. Um, so it's kind of the same as in 2008. Um, what I just wonder is um, we have zero corporate events, we have zero school uh, or, you know, schools are zero, corporate events a little bit here and there. Uh, in 2008, did you still do the school and just not the corporate events and a lot of backyard parties um, because I think if we didn't have uh, the virus right now the schools would have rented from us but now it's zero I mean I can't remember when I was at the at the public school we've done some uh, uh, private schools um, but in 2008 um, I'm sure the school did their events right the schools did their events, but remember the schools from in our area were either PTA or PTO money, which meant it was either granted money or f fundraised money, as opposed to the school spending their own budget. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it was a little different back then for this area. Mm. Is there anybody else they, um, um, add to that? Uh, Peter, can you give us um, your, I mean, you've been in the tin business for a long time. Can you tell us um, how you experienced 2008 and how you experienced 2020? I don't think he, I don't know if he's there. Peter, are you there? Okay, he's not there. Larry, um, you, um, you have worked with our industry for a long time. Um, what is your view of 2008 and 2020? What is the difference that you see between what happened at that, uh, that time and, and happened um, uh, this year? I think with 2008, we saw um, a, a lack of available money because people uh, financially were not um, in a good position. So we saw towards the end of 08, beginning of 09, several people uh, cashed in the 401ks and got into the inflatable business and started their businesses. Uh, most of them had no business sense. They had no idea what they were gonna do. They just bought you know, three or four bounce houses and let's go. We've probably seen that same scenario happen every year since then, where people rent it once for their kid's birthday party or twice and decide, God, this is a great business. Why am I going to give a couple hundred bucks to somebody else? We can make it. What I've seen in 2020 was the companies that had done backyard parties along with the corporate events have done a lot better. The ones that did, you know, 70, 80% corporate events are hurting because they didn't have enough inventory to do the, the, the backyard parties. 
they didn't have a customer database to go to for the backyard parties. So we've seen a lot of the smaller guys do phenomenally well. They made more money in the three, four months of COVID than they did all of 19. They, if you guys remember, there wasn't a water slide available in the United States, Africa, South Pole, anywhere. They're all gone. I mean, water slides were the hottest thing during the summer because parents needed to have some sort of entertainment so they could have a break. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of our customers complain about not only business being different, but them having to adjust uh, and, and find the employees. They were so busy during the summer that they burned out their employees. You know, they're working seven days a week. Not used to that. Mm -hmm. So I think 2020 has been a, a completely different experience than 2008. So do you think um, 2008, um, 2020 people um, in this industry hurt more than in 2008? What do you mean hurt more? Uh, financially, um, is it more devastating for our industry in 2020 than it was in 2008? I think from what what we've seen, 2008 was worse because nobody had experienced anything like that before. Industry still kind of in the, in the growing stages. The the 2020 version was all the, the, the smaller guys that uh, concentrated on the backyard parties have done very well. Mm. You know, we, we had uh, at least seven different new customers in New Jersey, all in the same area, come to me this summer to do repairs on inflatables. And they all bought you stuff for under seven, eight hundred dollars, water slides or combos uh, from whoever. I don't know where they got them from. They brought them to me to repair them, and they're telling me they're renting them for four hundred dollars, or which is about two hundred dollars less than some the the established guys are. But they're not licensed in New Jersey. They're not insured. But they're all bragging how they got into their new business, and uh, you know it's. It's a whole new world because people are, like you said, that you know they, they can pick up a bounce cheap or a combo or a slide, and they see their buddies making money. And we just had a slew of them come to us with these old ratty pieces. Some of them that they just repair it. I just got to get through a few weeks. I'm making four hundred tomorrow. I'm making three hundred this. So you know they were not necessarily running it like a business, but they saw an opportunity to jump into something, and. Uh, you know, that's, that started about 10 years ago when people, you know, again, you know, when things started changing, we saw a lot of that back then. But this summer, there was a tremendous amount. But these guys, one of the customers said to me something very in interesting. They said to me, people cannot buy swimming pools because there's no pools available. That's why they're renting water slides. And I went online to yeah. check around on Amazon and places and they were right. You know, so that really boosted water slides uh, rentals this summer. We waited 70 days to get a new pool in a rental. Yeah, I, I was trying to buy get one for four months in July. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, Al, um, tell me that in, um, uh, in, uh, Florida, how, South Florida, how was, and you're a smaller company, how was your um, summer? No, it's like what uh, uh, Larry was saying, you know, for me, you know, uh, my my case is a little bit crazy because I jump in full time uh, in May. In May, I decide, you know what, forget about it, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work or, or I'm going to go bankrupt. Uh, and I jump uh, full time, and man, I am a, a, a guy. My company, you know, have have you know uh, skyrocketed. You know, I am. I think I'm gonna finish this year like a uh, 125 percent. You know, over last year. So 
it has been uh, amazing for 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 me. Mm -hmm. And it, like like you say, guys, here you know, uh, in summer, uh, all the water slides you know were were super popular. You know, I I was renting you know even the the water slide that uh, uh, or start half here, you know, they, they put it uh, to my uh, disposition as well. And I was renting those uh, water slides as well because my inventory was not enough, you know, to, to you know, to supply the demand. So basically that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, any of your other guys, do you have questions for anybody? Uh, questions that you have? I can't see half of you, so um, you guys need to um, let us know any questions. Let's um, get them out. Yeah, I have a question because uh, Stephen first, by the way, you, you did a great explanation, you know, on, on, on the really good question that Ismael uh, brought, you know, uh, earlier. Uh, you, you were mentioning, you, you never mentioned, you know, uh, uh, for example, you know, rock works or something like that. In the position that we are right now, okay, uh, would you guys recommend, you know, a guy like me? I'm, 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 my money right now is on the backyard, uh, but I, you know, one of the things that I want to do is to get get prepared, you know, and get a couple of units, you know, to to be ready for when this, you know, open up again, you know, I can play a little bit more, you know, with, with big uh, events or something like that. Would you guys, if, if you guys, you know, uh, could recommend a guy like me, you know, uh, those units that you, that you say, you know, you know what, start with this because maybe when this open up again, these are the ones that are going to be, uh, uh, going to be helping you. Um, you're not going to need to, you know, to make those big checks for Larry or for, or for those, you know, uh, insurance company that I know, you know, the, the, the mechanicals, you know, are going to, are going to change that game for, for anybody like me. Um, rock walls are, are great money makers. They used to be much better money makers, you know, but they're still great money makers. They're a little scary for a new person without, you know, mechanical rods because you put it up in the air, but they're fine. They're good money makers and they're, if you find, there's some good used ones out there. But some states require the manufacturer to put the cables on every year. And that means you're going to be paying 1500 or 1700 bucks to the manufacturer. So if you get into rock walls, you want to really speak to the manufacturer, even if you're buying a used one, because you're going to be in bed with them for a long time. And, you know, that could be costly. However, rock walls are great to make money with. Um, turbo tubs, like the tubs of fun rides are great to make money with. They're simple. That's why I'm mentioning them, not because it's my ride. It's because it's a simpler setup. Somebody could actually do it without a lot of skill. Um, but like I said before, the trackless train, which I don't have any involvement, it's also a good ride and it could be done at a corporate event. It could be done at a backyard. doesn't benefit me, but it's a, it's a good ride to get started with because you're dealing with an engine that you, somebody locally might even have familiarity with. So you're not going to feel scared about it. So it's a good thing to get into those things. People love trains around the property, you know, for backyards, and then it gets you into the next level as well. So those are good options. <clears throat> I, I don't know how they, they train you, you know, work for, for other markets, but here in Miami, you know, there are so many trains and they are so inexpensive <laughs> that it doesn't make, you know, it's like, it's like the, you know, like the, like the game, game trailers, you know, uh, they're so cheap in the market that there's no money there. You right. Know. Then stick to an intermediate ride. That's not going to be hard for you to put together. You know, you want something that's going to take you 20, 30 minutes. That's not going to take 10 guys. And I, you know, one of the things when I started off in the buying rides for my rental company, who I used to buy, they're gone now, the people that I used to buy from, the, you know, passed away, old companies. I looked for things that we called KISS, keep it simple. If I could set it up or train somebody in 10 or 15 minutes, not that you don't want to give them thorough training, but then I know it's the ride for me. If they got to take nuts and bolts off as opposed to pulling a pin and putting it back in, I'd stay away from it. That's why a rock wall is a good start, even though it's not a mechanical. And maybe in your market, there might be a dime a dozen. Rock walls are a dime a dozen, but they're also selling for a dime a dozen right now, which means there might be an opportunity there. Um, then that's why a ride like a 
a, a tubs of fun ride is a better ride for a first ride than a swing ride because a swing ride you need a ladder to get up on top it's a little it's not difficult but if it's your first ride get your feet wet first get something that's not going to kill you but remember if you go with a ride like a carousel which is a wonderful seller you're only limited to the amount of kids that can go on a carousel so you're losing a lot of market until you get another ride so keep that as a thought Thank you so much. You're welcome. You know, the, the other day I was talking to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have another another question for you. The other day, you know, I was talking to Tommy Hall and he was mentioning about, he was mentioning uh, 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 this, it's like, a, and I'm sorry because I don't know the name of that game, of that, uh, yeah, of that game. Is that the four people, you know, they sit around and these go around, but it's manually. It's not a, they push A rock and roll. We make, if it goes 360, it's a rock and roll. If you pull the handles, ours is called the Whirly Bird. ADM has one that's called the Wizard. Ours okay. separates like a plus sign. It's more involved. The Wizard is two seats here, two seats here. It's a, it's a, a lesser expensive version, which is not, not a bad ride, just different design. Yeah, he was telling me that that is uh, really cool, cool because, you know, there's not mechanic there, you know, to start. Right. That's They're simple rides. They make money, and they have a scare factor, which every kid loves. Uh, so... You know, those rides can go to an intermediate school and they can still go to a college event. So there's more money to be made technically with those rides, you know, but you're looking at four kids. So that's how many an hour, you know, 50 rides an hour, 60, whatever. If you do the math divided by five minutes a ride, you know, a minute, two minutes for the ride on and off four minutes, you know, but they're, they're good money makers. They're good rental items. They wouldn't necessarily be something you'd want to have at a state fair because you only have four people at a time, but they're certainly good for the rental market and they're simple. And it's not that expensive to insure. Very safe. Like the mechanical bulbs. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Deadlines. <laughs> 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 Cody cool. know a lot about zip lines. I heard Corey's our resident expert on zip lines. Yeah. He's in a hot tub. <laughs> yeah, it's a hot tub. You know, no, I told the people last night, um, believe it or not, I have my zip line out um, in the next two weeks. I don't, I don't know what day, but um, we have our zip line out, believe it or not, the first time this year. <laughs> so. They make big bucks, though, right? Yeah, we, we get like, I think, $2,800 um, for three or four hours. And it's really, the one that I have is very easy to set up. Um, but I mean, you, there's a lot of um, danger around it, how to do it right and things like that. I think my only ride that went out this year was my zip line. Out of everything. I think that's the only thing that went. Yeah, nothing else. Just the zip line. Ty, was that a... a a inflatable one or a fixed one? Inflatable. Okay. All right. Any other questions? We have uh, a couple of good guys here, so let's. Um, um, let, uh, I, I would like to have everybody opportunity to ask a question. Bill, do you have a question? And we have uh, Aldo. Um, fun time bounces, jumpy Angelo. Ask a question. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Any other questions? I'd like to say something about the Euro bungees. You go ahead. Um, I owned a, a vertical reality Euro bungee combo, uh, rock wall combo. And um, I, I'll tell you the likes and dislikes. I'm bringing it up because of the mechanical rides and the rock walls uh, and even the zip line. Um, I personally hated, it was a great renter and it made money and I never had an incident. But I personally didn't like the Euro bungees because of all the chains and the wires, you know, the, uh, the cables. I just didn't like that I had to have an expert setting it up however i had one guy who i knew if he went out with it he could take three or four other guys i never had to worry about it 
So it was fine because I had the right guy. Otherwise, I was just never fond of it because I was always afraid they were going to leave a cable and not put it back in the box that we kept for the cables. So I just personally didn't like that ride to send out. Now, I know some of you go out on every event, which I did. I went out on a lot of events, but I didn't run everything. You know, as time goes on, you get bigger, you have staff. Um, but I, that always worried me, you know, just trying to keep all those cables together. But it was a good money maker, especially the combo, because people would pay. Even when the market went down, we were getting twelve to fifteen hundred. When the market was good, we were getting twenty five hundred for the combo. So when you can get that kind of money, I'd rather do that than ten drop offs, you know, bounces. So just chatting about it. That's all. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really it's so interesting because. There, there's so many people that, you know, that always push you, you know, to, to enter into the mechanicals and there are other ones that say, no, man, don't do that. You know, that is another animal. And it's, you know, it's, everybody have their, their own opinion, you know, but it's really interesting that it's, that it's a, a, it's a, it's a divided market as well. Well, like, I love ahead. mechanical stuff, but then I hate it at the same time. Like it, Steven's right. It is scary to send out a Euro bungee or a zip line and not know about it. Like it makes you uncomfortable unless you have that guy that you can trust. So it, it's a hard one. Well, I can tell you with my zip line, it's me and Rico and one other guy that's not working for me anymore that set up the zip line. Nobody else did it um, because I've heard what happened with other people. So. Uh, I would go out and, and set up a zip line because I didn't trust um, everybody. Yeah, totally agree. I that. can tell you that the zip lines have caused six figure payouts because somebody didn't pay attention to either hooking them up after they got up the stairs or um, the experience operators that were trying to settle down the people once they got up there that were afraid since they're 30 foot in the air, um, never remembered to hook them back onto the line. They stepped off and were injured. It caused two insurance companies to pull out of insuring the industry because there were six figure payouts. Um, so it's very important that you have the trained personnel and on the two big claims that we had, they were trained. They'd been there, you know, maybe 20 times with a rock wall or the zip lines. So it's real important that if you have those mechanicals, that you make sure that they're very well trained, that there's a checklist, that they know what they need to do. Step one, step two, step three, step four, before they let them step off of that platform. And it doesn't matter if it's a Euro bungee, it's a rock wall, or it's a zip line. They're all the same things. You've got to make sure that your people are trained. It's got to be documented so that the insurance company has something to fight with um, as far as if there is a claim. Because they, they got to pay no matter what. It's negligence. And it, it's not that you didn't train them. It's not that you trained them and, they, and maybe they screwed up. They just... They have to pay. It's negligence. That's what the insurance is for. It pays on negligence. So it's very hard to defend an operator on one of those type of claims. So if you guys understand, this, the severity of the claim is much higher than a bounce house. In, in New Jersey, we're supposed to have uh, an attendant with everything, including inflatables. Now, they do look the other way for backyard parties because they decided to be nice to us and look the other way. However, um, every time we send out an inflatable or a rock wall or, or a zip line, we're supposed to have the operator sign that they understand how to run the ride, that they read the manual. There's a sheet that we use that we fill out showing that they learned all this. There's another sheet that somebody fills out saying that they trained the operator, then the operator signs off on it. Because God forbid something does happen, you also don't want them to see you as that you, what you just send some guy out there to run it. You, now you have a little bit of background and your worker can't say, not that this helps with a settlement, but it's still better than not having it. Your worker can't say, I didn't know how to run it. He just told me to stand in front of it. 
at least you have a document or two documents that show they were trained on it. So that's something that they make us do in New Jersey. The other thing that I always do at my big events when I'm on them, I mean, it's been a little while since I've been out there, but I always lectured all of my staff. We'd walk around from ride to ride, not just even mechanic. I mean, I'm saying even the joust and the bungee run, which were all things that would go out on every big event. And we, I would explain that the joust, not ours, but there was an accident years ago in Texas where a guy got hit on the head because there was no referee there. So it's important that you notice they stop so they don't keep hitting themselves with the pole when somebody's down because they hurt their neck. You know, so I would do that not kind of as a scare tactic, but I would do it on every big event because I want them to take it seriously, not like, okay, I'm just standing in front of the ride doing my job. They have to know it's serious without being afraid. But I thought it was important for me to remind them over and over that when you're in the boxing ring, you don't allow this, you don't allow that. Even though they rolled their eyes and they already knew it, it was something that I felt helped us a lot and uh, made the operators remember every day that it's important to take the job seriously and still have a good time. I know some of you don't even have to supply operators or attendants, but that's what we did. You know, supplying the attendants is an interesting argument. 20 years ago when we started doing the amusement industry, that was the thing. They thought that the, that the attended rides would be a lower exposure than unattended. And it's just the opposite because the attended rides, you're 100% you're responsible. With the unattended ride, they sign off whether they're trained or not. That usually comes out in court that they're, you know, hey, he had me sign a paper. He didn't tell me nothing. So, you know, it's really hard from the insurance standpoint to defend you guys because the attended ride should be safer, but if somebody gets injured, it's 100% your fault. So it's really a catch-22, it's a double-edged sword. So insurance industry hasn't figured out what the heck to do with that. Hey, Larry, and along those lines, because I think that would actually surprise some people too, but have, have claim related, have you ever looked at the numbers to see if the states that are actually um, regulated are less draw less claims in those states that are regulated? Does that make sense? It seems, yes. it seems like it'd be a stupid question to ask because you Not would think that the data would show the, the more regulated states would be less claims, but is that actually true? Uh, um, Corey, you've known me for a while. I am very much on data and my database collects more stuff than probably most insurance companies. We have looked at that. And it doesn't seem to help the severity, but it helps the frequency. So it means that the claim amount is still high, but it doesn't happen as often. Um, the amount of training that, that the industry provides is subpar because of the turnover. And, you know, you can't have somebody stand next to somebody and figure out what's going on. It, it, it's almost a psychological deal when you're dealing with these customers because you got to figure out, is that kid going to be a problem child or is the one behind them the problem child? And so, you know, it, it, it's really hard for you guys to be able to try to, to guess whether it's the employee or the, or the customer. And if it's a drop-off, it's real easy, supposedly, except for it's, it's been very hard for the insurance industry to be able to defend you guys to a point where we don't pay the claim. But it almost always ends up getting paid because it, the, the amount of documentation that is lacking hurts the industry. The, the lack of documentation of training, the lack of documentation, what they actually signed and whether they, you know, yeah, you, It looks like we lost somebody. Did something happen with the internet? <laughs> <laughs> 